Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our horror reading um, for Halloween. Um, I am Josh Gothier, and I have with me three fantastic um, fellow authors of dark fiction and horror and fantasy and all such fun genres. Um, we'll get to introductions a little bit more in a minute, but um, if everyone wants to say hello. 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 Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah, um, thank you all for joining tonight. Um, this started um, between me and Renee. We were, um, realized that we wanted to pull together a little bit of a um, just Halloween reading tonight. We all like sharing our stories. We like hanging out. We like spooky stuff. Um, so Renee um, really helped to bring this all together, brought some people in for it. Um, and we are very excited to share with you tonight. So um, very quickly, I'll just go over um, who we have, and then I'll give everyone a chance to talk about themselves a little bit more in, um, as they read. Um, but I'm Josh Gothier. I write um, fiction, uh, fantasy, horror, romance, theater, um, all over the place. And um, my first book, um, Land of Outcasts, came out earlier this year. This is not horror. It is adventure fantasy, but it's very fun, and there's a battle unicorn. Um, so definitely check that yeah. out if any of that sounds appealing to you. Um, we also have Catherine Silva, who is the author of multiple books. Is it seven? Oh, six. Six. Yeah. Um, the most recent one being The Wild Dark. Uh, Emma J. Gibbon is the award-winning author of, um, and published the fiction collection Dark Blood Comes from the Feet. And Renee DeCamillis is an author, editor, and musician who, who released the novella, The Bone Cutters. Um, in the description of this video is um, links to everyone's websites and full bios. Definitely check out everyone's work here. Um, it will be well worth your time to do so. Um, so yeah, I will kick things off with the reading tonight and then um, we'll move through and everyone will have the chance to share a little bit um, with you as we go. So cue in to my start. Um, I will be reading a, from a forthcoming um, novel that I've sh uh, shelved a little bit, but it will be um, coming out in some form in the future. The working title is Dig Up the Bones, and it is a um, dark fantasy, horror fantasy um, novel that I'm pitching as basically Alien meets Game of Thrones of sorts. Um, and so I'm reading a few different selections from the opening um, with the caveat that all of this will probably change by the time it seems sees the full light of day. Um, but this is right from the opening, so I don't think it requires much more setup than that. Gods, Allard's bones feel as though they're going to break at the slightest wrong movement. It's the rain, which hasn't let up for days. It's the chill that claws its way into him even when they shelter around meager campfires. The damp is in his clothes. It's in the darkness scratching at the back of his mind no matter how much he tries to ignore it. He hates the musty stink of his own traveling gear, needs a bath before this night is over. Through it all, the, his nag of a horse bumps and sways along a park, the pockmarked dirt road too far from civilization hemmed in by a black forest that seems never to end. Run away, Allard. Run from all your sins. Allard shivers, his thoughts for once blessedly interrupted by the voice of his companion. Drink? Twisting in the saddle, Allard spares a glance for the hulking brute close behind. His bodyguard holds out a grimy flask. Allard is so worn, so cold, that he nearly allows himself a swallow of whatever common swill it contains. But even that cheap liquor wouldn't warn him. It certainly wouldn't make the weather any more pleasant or ease the rash burning over his right arm. He'd claw the damn thing off if he thought it would help. As it is, he has to mind his scratching. It wouldn't be the first time tearing at himself until blood ran red. He just needs to put it out of his mind. Eyes ahead. He knows what he's here to do. Unaffected by his refusal, Bax grunts and takes another long draught, brown liquor dribbling from the corner of his mouth. The larger man is a sight, with a face mashed and scarred from too many conflicts, rough clothes that needed a wash before they began their journey, and a build that would make a city guard think twice before getting in the way. 
The fact that Bax's left arm ends at the elbow does nothing to stop the man from gambling or brawling at any opportunity, to say nothing of the incessant drinking. But he was the only man Allard had been able to hire on his dwindling coin. After two weeks on the road with the man pro uh, proving to be nothing but a nuisance, Allard wonders if perhaps he should have saved his money. There is a wayhouse ahead of them. Allard is sure of this fact. He hasn't consulted his map for hours for fear of the rain falling heavier each moment, but he remembers their route just a little further. With each delay, the world draws its curtains closer around them. The rainfall casts them in a muffled roar of wet and darkness. The trees are little more than blotches at the edge of sight. If anything moves there, watching them, stalking them, Allard would not hear it until it seized his arm. Bax drinks more than he listens. That would be an ignoble end to one of Aldron's greatest scholars, torn to a bloody pulp on the roadside, along with a half-wit bodyguard of less value than a single book in Allard's saddlebags. Another mile, he grits out, not really caring if Bax hears him. Let the bastard wander off and save Allard the trouble of buying him another meal. Any confidence he forces into the words is for himself. Another mile, and we're at the way house and out of this deluge. Rest. He is ready to rest. This piss, Bax turns his face toward the sky, opening his mouth to drink the rain. This is nothing. It's what's behind us that I'm worried about. Allard doesn't want to look, but the word sees him. They both pause, reining in their horses and turning toward the eastern horizon at their backs. Allard feels his horse quiver. The beast does not want to stop here, probably feels the dark thing that follows them. All across the horizon, lost to trees in a darker night, black clouds roil like an angry sea. Shimmering through the darkness is a blood red glare like wildfire, like damnation itself. The storm has followed them for days. It is another reason so few even considered taking his coin at peak season. Few seek death. Few are still seek it under the shadow of a ruined storm. They linger a moment as if compelled. Allard has never witnessed one of these from beyond the safety of city walls. They were always fearsome, but even in childhood, they were never frightening. A novelty, something to watch from his window through the strange dark nights. Now, alone in the wilderness, it is something else entirely. The storm seems almost alive coursing with anger like some ancient being stalking them across the world. Foolishness, superstition, idiocy. He shakes the thought from his head and kicks his horse into motion. All the more reason to press on. It is getting late and spending another night in the elements is not an option worth entertaining, even without the storm. We both want a fire, a drink, a bed for the night. They'll keep riding until they find it. A bed and rest of and the rest of the comforts Allard deserves. He shoves through the creeping tinge of fear. Mile more. That's all. Um, so jumping ahead a little bit, they do find the way house where they are um, planning to wait out the storm. There's meat roasting somewhere inside the way house. Goat, perhaps, spices, potatoes, wood smoke, tobacco. Allard pauses in the entryway, feeling his body relax in the sudden warmth as he inhales the scent of food. He is done with the road, at least for a couple days. Anything beyond that can wait. Still, no one greets him. A ratty carpet covers the entryway. It was probably unpleasant looking, even when it was new. A staircase on the left wall leads to the upper levels, while a hall runs across the far end of the room. Opposite the entrance is the door to a common room. He hears voices inside. It's surprising, he hadn't expected to encounter many people on the road during the season. People are generally slow, irritating, and superstitious, but right now he felt he might actually enjoy some company, if they were the right sort, at least, the sort able to form a complete thought and express it in words. Don't just stand there, shut the door. A woman's voice barks the order, but before Alec can get a good look at her, she disappears down the hall to the left with something in her arms. She continues speaking from out of sight. Rolf, there's another one, see to him. Another one? 
Is that how this house greets guests of stature? Not to mention shouting orders at him as if he were one of the servants. Already faint, he feels his appreciation for the house dimming further. A lad of about 16 appears before Allard's thoughts go further. Unusually tall, with messy dark hair and eyes that don't lift from the floor, the boy slouches toward him. Welcome, sir, he says, his voice, his flat voice missing all appropriate defense, deference. Welcome to Stonehaven. Stonehaven. Allard had forgotten what the wayhouse was called. Not that it mattered. My horse needs attending. He unslings his cloak, spraying Rolf with droplets of mud and water. I'll need my things brought to my room, and then I shall require a bath. I'll take my meal immediately after. The boy nods, but makes no move to obey, his eyes still focused somewhere in the vicinity of Allard's ankles. Quickly now. Really, even for common folk, this is shameful. Finally, the boy snaps into motion. And treat my pet carefully, Allard calls as he disappears outside. It's worth more than you are. Um, we'll jump ahead just a tiny bit more. Allard gets settled and moves into the common room where he meets a pair of traveling merchants um, named Ike and Kai. Before, we can speak th before they can speak further, the woman of the house finally returns carrying a tray laden with steaming bowls. Rolf fo follows closely behind with a basket of bread. They circle the room, starting with the two hunters, then Bax, and finally Allard and the others. The proper thing would have been to serve him first. Allard adds the breach in propriety to the list of slights he has experienced here. The young couple opposite him either do not notice the offense or do not care. They only lean over their bowls, inhaling the steam wafting from them. It does smell good, but the woman of the house still doesn't serve him as she has the others. Instead, she stands behind him, one hand holding the tray, the other on her hip. She meets his gaze and holds it. You a magus? Pardon? The stare, the tone, everything about this is highly improper. An actual magus would make her regret the question in an instant. A magus, a caster, are you one of them? I am not. He keeps his voice level, allowing his displeasure to come th through in the tone. Where was Bax? Downing another mug of ale. The woman stares for another couple moments before passing some silent judgment. Good enough. She finally deigns to give him his stew. Name's Bilka. You let me know if you need anything. Her face lightens somewhat. I apologize for the questions, my lord. Out here, we can't be too careful with certain types. That, at least, is true. It doesn't excuse her behavior, but at least they have a chance of setting some things to right. That will be all for now. He turns to his stew and the plate of bread Rolf set beside it. Warm, flavored with herbs, it is better than Allard had hoped for. Some of these places carve crows into a pot and serve it half cooked, expecting both coin and thanks for their effort. He eats as quickly as he can in polite company, willing his stomach not to betray how long it's been since he had a proper meal. Uh, they continue introductions a little bit more. Allard flinches at a bite of pain in his arm. He was scratching. For how long? And did the others notice? Forcing his hand flat on the table, he wonders if the sensation on his arm is only his imagination or if he has managed to draw blood again. Are you all right? Kai asks. Perfectly fine. Ike isn't finished with his previous line of thought. She asked if we were magi too when we arrived. After we told her no, I asked why she was worried. Didn't say much, but it sounds as though some sort of dark magus passed through recently. Don't think anything happened, but it's clear he put the fear into both of them, her and the boy. Kai elbows him again, but Ike seems hardly to notice as he speaks quicker, nervous and half excited, the way children get when fascinated by something that should rightly scare them. I always knew being on the road had its risks, he says, but to think of casters like that out here with us, that we could meet them on the road at any turn. Now there's a thought to keep you up at night. Ike finally notices Kai's dark look and stills his tongue, but the shell has been cracked. Allard can see the youth beneath. It explains a lot. This must be the couple's first journey far from home, Ike's at least. 
an arranged marriage like as not forced into travel by whatever delicate situation gave them such urgency. Perhaps Allard could forgive them some of their peculiarities. Kai did not allow the silence to last long as she set, the, set aside her empty mug. Tell me, scholar, what is your field of study? The smile that crosses Allard's face is real. Doubtful that these two would truly understand it, but he is always happy to describe his work to a willing audience. He snaps his fingers to get Rolf's attention and holds up his own empty mug before beginning. But his answer never has the opportunity to take form. Before he can speak, the front door of the wayhouse slams open, startling the entire company. A man stands in the entryway, his white and gold armor marking him as an elite soldier of the chancellery. The side of the man's face is blistered with recent burns. His dark eyes rove over the gathered company. Everyone averts their gaze, even Allard. The chancellery arriving is a most unfortunate development, and Allard has no wish to be beaten tonight. And I will stop there. Um, thank you all for listening, and I will hold uh, hand things over to Catherine to read next. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Uh, I am going to be reading a selection from my recent book, The Wild Dark. Um, I'm going to read part of chapter one to start. So here we go. Dreams cocooned me, wrapping me in their silky embrace like a thousand scarves. I didn't care if I never woke. In them I wasn't guilty. I wasn't alone. All was as it should be, but something yanked me out before I was ready to leave. I opened my eyes to the darkened room. Rain poured outside, its white noise a strange comfort outside my bedroom window. I pulled the thick wool blanket closer. The small room had put me on edge at first, before I knew where everything was. As the days passed, I recognized the outline of the chair next to the door, the trunk full of blankets at the end of the bed, and the small flickers from the fire in the wood stove outside my bedroom door. This place had become more than a temporary retreat. I turned onto my side and looked out into the rain. Why did I wake up? A board creaked on the porch. I stilled. It wasn't the old cabin making its usual sounds. The structure groaning in the wind, pipes rattling, treads loosening on the stairs out front. This was something heavy walking across the floor of my front porch toward my door. No one lived within several miles of this camp. I was in the middle of the woods. I slipped my legs out from under the covers, goosebumps instantly growing on my skin. Quietly reaching behind the side table, I curled my fingers around the baseball bat there. An inch of safety nudged me as I tiptoed to the window and peered out. The bushes blocked most of my view, and the downpour made it hard to make out any shapes in the night. It could be anything, I told myself, as I slid my sweatpants from the top of the chest and pulled them on. I crept toward the main living area. Another window looked out on the deck next to the front door. I steeled myself as I looked out. The deck was cloaked in shadows. To my left was an upright shape, a person walking in an ungainly way. They shifted back and forth as though they couldn't get their balance. Must be some drunk hunter looking for a place to sleep it off, I thought. I kept a firm hold on the baseball bat and moved to the front door. The memory of my days as a cop rushed back to me like an old friend. It had been months since I'd carried a badge, but more than anything, I wanted to see the look on this guy's face when I ripped open the door and shouted for him to get down on the ground with his hands behind his back. He'd probably pee his pants. He'd probably stumble off the deck and run back into the rain from wherever he'd come from. Then I could get some sleep. The creek stopped in front of the door. I braced myself, my hand on the doorknob. As I readied myself to jerk open the door, cowardice got the better of me. Who's there? I called. There was no answer, not even the sound of another footstep. Hello? Do you need help? Are you lost? 
Nothing. The rain was pretty loud. Maybe they hadn't heard me. I turned the knob. Drowned by the deluge in wind, a faint voice blended with the static ambient. Liz. My name. They'd said my name. As quickly as I could manage, I jerked the door open and swung my bat up. Who the hell is? My voice echoed into the empty night. I frowned and stepped out onto the deck, looking from left to right. There was nobody. I stopped at the end of the deck, staring into the bushes. Water splashed against my bare toes as I tried to find some shape hiding within. I, could have been hear I couldn't have been hearing things. There had been a shape out here. The creaking was loud. I checked the other side of the deck. No one. There weren't even any, there weren't even any wet shoe prints on the wood. A twig snapped in the trees. I trained my sights on them, squinting through the deluge in the dark. Something stood there, staring straight at me. The eyes were golden, barely catching the licks of the firelight from within the house. A low growl rose up. I took a step back, a board squealing under me. I glanced down for only a moment. The brush rustled as something dashed off into the thicket. I backed into the cabin and locked the door behind me. The crackle of the wood stove seemed loud in the quiet space. I added another log to the fire and stirred the embers with my poker. I wasn't going crazy. Someone was here, a human someone. Grabbing a fleece blanket from the chest in the other room, I curled up in the chair in front of the fire and stared through the glass window at the stove, into the stove at the flames. I listened for anything out of the ordinary. I had to have imagined it all. I waited for sleep to take me, but I was too wired. A voice, the voice on playback in my mind. I forced my eyes to close and lay my head against the soft upholstery. The sounds of the rain merged with the crackling of the fire, washing in and out of my ears. The heat warmed my chilled skin and the blanket suddenly became another world of comfort. Even in sleep, that voice called to me from the darkness. I knew that voice. It knew me too. No amount of sleep could change the impossibility of that voice's owner being here now. He was gone. He was dead and gone. So now we're going to skip ahead. Getting there. Uh, we're going to go to chapter two, uh, which is the next day. The mist never lifted as the day progressed. It rained again around noon, the storm resuming last night's fury in little than half an hour. I spent much of the day packing up my belongings, draining water from the camp's pipes, and trying to finish up reading a book my sister had recommended a long time ago. It was a gothic romance, or at least that's how Dana had described it. It was full of pain and sickness and night, and it made my stomach twist and turn as I tried to focus on the words. I, snapped, I slapped the book shut, still several chapters from the end, and stuffed it into my packed suitcase at the end of the bed. I needed to get gas in town and a few other essentials for the trip back home. I didn't want to have to stop tomorrow and be tempted by the promise of remaining in town where no one knew about my past. No one but Ranger Feld anyway. Ranger Feld is a uh, forest ranger that she met that morning. I wouldn't have been surprised if he tried to look me up the minute he got back to a computer. Not that it mattered anyway. I was never going to run into him again. I snatched my keys from the hook by the door, locked the cabin, and climbed into my car. Flipping on the wipers, I drove down the pothole-riddled dirt driveway toward the main road. The path slinked through the woods, down steep hills, switchbacking until the reflective paint brightened the highway ahead. The mountains rose above around me like chopped waves in a sea of trees. I could easily be lost in them, knowing that miles and miles of wilderness and its cracks and crevices separated me from the doldrums of my everyday routines. This place had yawned open, allowing me inside its dark mouth to escape all else. I was grateful and terrified. What Feld had said stuck with me the entire ride down into town. It was dangerous out here, and someone as desperate for refuge as I was could easily mistake isolation for tranquility. 
That was why I needed to leave. I passed the rain-soaked forests and the turbulent rivers along the roadside as I drove further down into town. Buildings slowly appeared until I finally reached an intersection with a gas station directly across the road. I rolled in, pumped my gas beneath the cover of the forecourt and went inside to grab some road snacks. The halogen lights blinded me as I scoured for things to take with me the next day. Pringles for the win, I decided, grabbing a couple cans. Snagging a bottle of water from a fridge, I went to the coffee station. Ooh. Sorry. And I went back a page by accident. Uh, there we are. Uh, I was craving another cup, and I'd used the last of my grounds that morning. Coffee dribbled into my paper cup as I glanced around the convenience store. The teller was a wiry college age kid with blue hair and several tattoos showing beneath his black uniform. A couple of girls his age poked through snacks in the aisle two rows behind me, their dialogue a plethora of, oh my God, and shut up. The bell dinged on the door as a hunter in, heavy wool, in a heavy wool coat and blaze orange hat walked in and went to the counter, paying for some cigarettes. He'd left his chip light blue truck running near the door. A dead deer glared at me from the pickup bed, a pair of small antlers meekly jutting from its head. I pulled the full cup away from the machine and fitted the plastic lid over it, my thoughts still in another place. You hear anything about that missing kid? The guy behind the counter said to the hunter with the cigarettes. They're still looking, but word is they found his car this morning up on the notch road, the man answered, dropping a crinkled $10 bill on the counter. I looked up. That's near where I was staying. They did. Yep, driver's side door torn off. Had to have been a bear. The idiot probably left food in his car. The kid nodded and handed him his change. Did they find anything else? Yeah, the man scooped the coins into his hand. Blood. I turned to, to bring the coffee and the water and the snacks to the counter. I didn't want to listen anymore and I had errands to run. I wanted to get back to the cabin before nightfall. I walked up the aisle and wondered what time I should head out in the morning. When I looked out the big windows to the gas pumps, I froze. There was a man standing next to my car. I couldn't make out his face, but the posture and the outline I recognized. The coffee cup slipped out of my hand and splattered at my feet. Uh-oh, one of the girls said nearby. They laughed. I grabbed some, le I grabbed some napkins from behind me and dropped them onto the spilt coffee. As they bled through, my gaze wandered back to my car. The man was gone. I'll get it, the clerk mumbled from behind the counter. He shuffled to the maintenance closet to collect a, a bucket and mop. The irritation in his voice wasn't hard to miss. The hunter stared at me as if I'd grown an extra arm. I tossed the napkins and the empty coffee cup in the trash. I'm sorry. I moved to grab another paper cup, but whispering behind me made me turn. The girls murmured to one another, their eyes shifting to me every now and again. I stared at them until they finally turned and left without buying anything. I watched them climb into their Mini Cooper from the safety of the store, waiting for the silhouette to appear. They pulled out and left. No one else appeared. No other shapes were suddenly visible in the parking lot. The clerk plunked the, buck the bucket down on the tile and with a squish, the mop hit the floor. My thoughts turned fleetingly toward getting another cup of coffee, but I didn't want to break my eye contact from the window, just in case. Hey, the attendant said, you're standing in it. That broke my gaze. I stepped back and let him sweep the mop over the place I'd been standing. I thought someone was standing by my car, I said by way of explanation. I owed him that at least. He craned his head to stare out the window. There's no one there now. It was only for a second, but I could have sworn. Did you want another coffee? He asked, one of his eyebrows suspiciously perked. I shook my head. At the counter, he rang me out with an irritated frown on his face. The hunter stood nearby, flipping through a magazine. His eyes bored holes into the back of my head. The attendant tore my receipt from the long stream of paper and handed it to me. Have a nice afternoon. I snatched my bag of food from the counter and pushed out the glass doors into the parking lot. I was sure the hunter and the attendant were already hypothesizing which mental hospital I'd escaped from. 
I made my way toward my car, listening for any noises out of the ordinary. The rain was coming down hard now and the traffic on the road nearby made it hard to differentiate any strange noises apart from it. I reached my car under the cover of the forecourt and set everything down on the hood. I circled the vehicle, peering in at the back seat. No one inside. I crouched down onto the cement and peered under the car. Again, there was nothing. I got in and locked the doors, an inch of safety calming me. It was nearly three. I'd slept only a few hours last night and the pouring rain only made my eyelids heavier. It's your imagination, I thought. A sudden yawn reinforced the idea more. You're still obsessing over last year. I pulled out of the gas station, confident I wouldn't be visiting that particular one again, and drove down the road further into town. And that is where I will stop. Thank you. Um, it's, I'm, I'm very glad that we've actually been able to meet tonight. Um, Cause I, I know I'm in Renee, but I, I'm, it's very good to, to meet you and to hear your work. Um, I've got another book for my to read pile now, so. Thanks. Um, but yeah, so with that, I will now turn things over to Emma to share um, our next reading of the evening. Hi. So I am going to read um, The Tale of Bobby Red Eyes, which is from my uh, fiction collection. That blood comes from the feet. Um, this story is uh, based on an actual urban legend from my hometown. Um, and the, the tunnel that features it in it did actually exist, um, but it's now been torn down. But it's based on a real place. The Tale of Bobby Red Eyes. Down the lane and over the hill, up the cinder path and through the trees, find the tunnel mouth and go inside. Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes. When did we learn this? It was always there from the time we started school, even before. Someone's older sister was told by a young aunt who knew someone who knew someone else. Everyone had a link to Bobby. We chant it in the schoolyard, whisper it to each other at sleepovers, tell each other that Bobby Red Eyes would get us if we told a secret. The dirt lane that led to the cinder path was at the top of our street next to the cornfields below. At harvest, the farmers would leave a hay bale for the kids so we'd leave the rest alone. It never worked. One year, my brother fell asleep in one of the entire neighborhood to look for him for hours, fearing he'd been stolen. Stranger danger was what our parents were most afraid of, but we knew better. Bobby was scarier. At least once a year, someone set fire to the cornfield and it was spread to the fences of the houses nearest to the fields. We would stand and watch the red glow until the heat was too much. One year, one of the houses plastic window sills melted. Bobby was a kid who got run over by a train. Bobby was never a kid, but a demon pretending to be a kid. Bobby died in a fire in a house that used to be there before the tunnel. Bobby is a story kids tell other kids around here because there's nothing else to do. There was nowhere else to go. We were allowed on the lane and no further. When someone said, let's go to the tunnel, we didn't give it a second thought. We had too much time on our hands and nothing to do. The tunnel was miles away, but we wouldn't be called supper for hours. Our parents would never know. We'd cover each other. In late summer, the path was hardened and cracked by the sun. We skipped down there, shouting and hollering and calling each other cruel names. Then the embankment at the end of the lane. The bravest took the quickest, steepest route and slid on their butts down the incline, dusty jean pockets for the rest of the way. That wasn't me. I took the gentler route to the broad black cinder path that had once been a railway track, its sleepers long gone. We were quieter here and talked with our heads bent towards each other. For a mile, we walked up the black road. Bobby was a kid like us who got murdered in the woods. They buried him in the tunnel. If you say Bobby Red Eyes three times in the mirror on Halloween, he'll be your reflection. Bobby murders animals and leaves them in the tunnel. Bobby never existed, he's just an urban legend. Down the lane and over the hill, up the cinder path and through the trees. Find the tunnel mouth and go inside. Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes. By the time we got to the trees, we were silent. A miniature forest had sprung up between the embankments. The tree trunks were twisted and the limbs broken, boughs hanging low. 
We walked single file, bent double under the branches. By afternoon, we were tired, but at that point, we were, there was no return. Another half mile through the trees, crawling in places, our hair snagged and arms scratched, hot, itchy bug bites covering us. Incongruous items half glimpsed in the woods, an old washing machine, a burnt out car, a rolled hail bale, bale rotting, a tangled orange net. Towards the end, on hands and knees for the last section of the woods, I could smell the dead air of the tunnel. I wanted to go back, go home, but there was literally no turning. Trees on either side and another couple of kids behind me. If I'd been the last kid, would I have turned back? Probably not. Peer pressure is a powerful thing. And to go through the woods down the isolated cinder road alone, that was nearly as scary as facing the tunnel. The sun when it was on its way down, a cold breeze snaked through the trees and chilled our sweaty, itchy skin. Bobby's not a kid. He was a signalman like the one in the story. Bobby was a soldier who never came back from the war. Bobby is a kid. He fell off the top of the tunnel and got run over by a train. Only babies believe in Bobby. Ghost stories are for kids. Down the lane and over the hill, up the cinder path and through the trees. Find the tunnel mouth and go inside. Bobby red eyes, Bobby red eyes, Bobby red eyes. The trees opened up and we stared into the screaming black mouth of the tunnel. Made of blackened brick and covered in faded spray painted graffiti from the 70s. I shivered, but I wasn't cold. The locals call it the mild tunnel. There's a tiny semicircle of light at the end. I started to back away into the trees. One kid had already been in the tunnel, once. There's dead dogs in there, he said. If your dog goes missing, this is where it is, drowned in the red ochre. There's a massive, massive pool of it halfway through. Don't step in it or it'll suck you under. I knew what red ochre was. My terrier, Brandy, was impossible to keep in the yard. He'd once come home covered in the thick red clay. Had my little dog come down here and managed to get back out again? It'll get dark soon, I said. Maybe we should turn back. If you see two eyes looking at you as you lie in bed, it's Bobby telling you you'll join him soon. No, if you see, see two red eyes and say, Bobby red eyes, you can't catch me, then you'll be fine. No, Bobby red eyes, you can't catch me, will bring the red eyes, but you're safe because you called him. It's probably the red lights from your stereo, stupid. Bobby doesn't exist. They were all already making their way in. And what could I do? I didn't want to get left behind. We walked in the middle of the cavernous tunnel built to allow two steam trains with plenty of room. Cut into the countryside to keep the rail flat. We shied away from the edges that had niches every hundred feet so the workers could flatten themselves against brick line safety when the train came roaring past. These dark nooks were the perfect place for Bobby to hide to reach out a pale arm and drag someone in. We avoided them. Soon we were running out of light. Let's go back and try another day, I said. I was ignored. We linked arms and continued walking in the middle. The cinder path had ended. Now it was trampled down dirt. And someone stumbled in the dusky light. We pulled them up. I was at the end, not popular enough to have two arms comforting mine. Bobby was a kid who didn't have any friends. So he jumped in front of the train. Bobby was pushed in front of the train by bullies. Bobby was the bully and he fell. Bobby was a kid who died, but he's not haunting the mile tunnel. The further we walked, the more uneven the ground was. The air was getting even staler and there was barely any light left. Just the darkening semicircle at the end of the tunnel, still so far away. A kid started singing, tried to get the others to join in. No one took him up on his offer and his thin reedy voice died in the darkness. Soon, we couldn't see what was right in front of us. The same kid started whistling the funeral march. Someone told him to shut up. The rest of the kids laughed and made ghost, ghost noises. A girl in the middle shouted, I just saw red eyes, she screamed, but it wasn't a real one. It was a squealing of a girl used to getting attention. Down the lane and over the hill, up the cinder path and through the trees, find the tunnel mouth and go inside. Bobby red eyes, Bobby red eyes, Bobby red eyes. We must be somewhere near the middle now, someone said. Watch out for red ochre, said another. How can we do that, said the other kid at the end of the line. It's pitch black. There's a twittering above us, a suggestion of movement. 
It's just bats, said another kid. The squealy girl started up again. She had long hair. Everyone knew that bats tangled themselves in long hair. That's just a myth, said the bat kid. The girl with the long hair still whimpered. We trudged along. The floor got wetter and stickier at our feet. A damp chill moved over us. Water drops echoed off the walls. Our forward movement was unstoppable now. We didn't have a plan. Were we really going to the end? And if we did, then what? No one had thought of that. We could call our parents to pick us up from the country road near where the mile tunnel ended. We could all get into trouble for sure. The mile tunnel is a portal to hell. The mile tunnel was built over a graveyard. They left the bones. The mile tunnel was once filled with poison gas that killed some of the workers. No, when they were building the tunnel, some workers died from exhaustion. They bricked their bodies up inside the walls. The mile tunnel is an old disused railway tunnel that isn't structurally safe. It got harder and harder to walk. The red ochre sucked at our feet at every step, getting deeper each time. Soon it was oozing, cold and thick over the tops of my sneakers. Let's go back, I said. We have to be more than halfway now. My brother said that once you get past the red ochre, it's easy, said the whistling kid. Might as well keep going. Yeah, Roberta, sneered someone else. Don't be a chicken. Ankle deep now, I kept trudging, pulling on the arm of the next kid. The red ochre is a mark. Once you get it on you, your bob is forever. The red ochre is actually the blood of the workers mixed with mud. Wrong. It's dog's blood. So many do dead dogs. Bobby lives in the mud. He's the one who drags the dogs down. Red ochre is just iron oxide in the dirt. It's wet because of the conditions in the tunnel. Soon, I was up to my knees in red ochre. Was it happening to the others? They seemed to be moving much more easily than me. And then they started. Was it the bat kid, the squealy girl with long hair? The whistler? It was too hard to tell. They began chanting, laughing as they did. Down the lane and over the hill, up the cinder path and through the trees. Find the tunnel mouth and go inside. Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes. The chain of arms broke apart like a string of pearls snapping. The rest of the kids ran back where they, we came from. I heard their feet squelching and then slap echoing as they got to firmer ground. They were shouting, Roberta, come on, you've got to run. But I couldn't. I was up to my thighs in cold, gritty mud, and every move I made to turn to free my legs and feet made me sleep, sink deeper and deeper. I fell forward and my arms plunged into the red ochre and I couldn't see anything but blackness. I was, it was pulling me under, sucking me down. Now to my waist, my elbows. I couldn't hear the others. They were long gone. Now to my shoulders and neck. I twisted my head to try and breathe, but it was no use. Soon it was over my nose and mouth and filling my eyes, covering the top of my head. Down the lane and over the hill, up the cinder path and through the trees. Find the tunnel mouth and go inside. Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes, Bobby Red Eyes. Bobby was a girl who thought she had friends but didn't. Bobby disobeyed her parents and walked down the cinder path. Bobby was abandoned by neighbourhood kids and drowned in the red ochre. Bobby was a kid who went missing in the mile tunnel. Bobby never existed. She is just a story. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, it's funny, I remember reading that story in your collection and it's always such a different thing hearing the author share it and just how that presentation comes, but um, it, it's so excellent, it's so creepy and atmospheric. Um, okay, and I will now turn things over to Renee to round us out. Hello. This has been great. I really enjoyed all of your readings. Yes, this is awesome. So anyways, yeah. So, hey, I am Renee DeGamillis. Um, and though I am the author of The Bone Cutters, I'm not reading from that tonight. I'm going to share um, one of my short stories called Bad Trip Highway. It was published in the um, Wicked Women Anthology from NEHW Press in uh, November of 2020. So I'm gonna start right from the beginning of the story. So there's no need for a setup or a backstory or anything. Start right from the beginning. So I hope you're ready. This is Bad Trip Highway. 
My mushroom high tweaks, zigzagging and spinning along with my car. I hammer the brake pedal to the floor, spin a 360 across the median and tear up even more grass on my way back into the glistening southbound lane of the midnight highway. The hitchhiking hobo I almost take out with the rear end of my Oldsmobile Delta 88 in my hydroplane fishtail is standing stunned and glued to the guardrail. The drenched dude beside the ditch holds his head high in smug regard or a cautionary stance. I can't say. As I come to a screeching, uh, as I come to a cre- screeching stop beside him in the breakdown lane, hanging from the end of his ape long arm is what looks like a ventriloquist dummy case. It reminds me of the one my un- zany uncle Charlie used to bring over to the house when I was a kid. The center of the hobo's patchwork top hat is caved in from the torrential downpour. A whirlpool of rain is circling around the brim and running like a waterfall off the lopsided edge in the back. I've always wondered why so many people warn against picking up hitchhikers. Why not help someone stranded and down on their luck? I've never been able to pass by a thumb without stopping to offer a ride. And every single person was grateful. Some had even offered me gifts of gratitude. A journal, a burger, an amethyst, a couple of Viagra, a hand-carved walking stick topped with a quartz crystal, a runestone necklace, Rado, for safe travel and safe journeys which still hangs from my rearview mirror. And one guy offered me the shirt off his back, a vintage Led Zeppelin concert t-shirt from the 70s. I refused the tea, of course. It was meaningful music memorabilia, but I thanked him by sending him off with a joint of killer green bud. And every character I've ever met with their thumb out has inspired a new psychedelic tune for my band. And that's exactly what I need this time. Another great tune. One more track, another hit. We need it in four days before the album goes to mastering. That's what the record company has been breathing down my neck over the last couple of days. But no ideas have come to me. Nothing. As the primary songwriter in the band and with all the members waiting on me and the record company suits tap, tap, tapping their fingers, I'm desperate. I have one day left. One day to write it, teach it to my boys, polish the performance, and record it. So here I am tripping behind the wheel in the middle of a rain-choked night, picking up another thumb. Gotta find inspiration wherever you can, I always say. I yell out the sliver-sized opening of the window. Hop on in, you hipster hobo. I fling open the passenger door. The bottom corner slams into his leg and knocks him to his knees. He jumps to his feet so gracefully, it looks like a choreographed dance move rather than a fall. Shit, dude, that wasn't supposed to happen, I say through shroom-induced laughter as he tosses his dummy case on the floor and plops his soggy wet ass into the seat beside me. Take a toke to ease the pain. I point to the blunt hanging half out of the open ashtray. The joint is lit in in his mouth before he shuts the door. Thanks for the smoke. His words sound strained as he tries to speak while holding in his hit. Three smoke rings puff out of his mouth, one after the other, and float up, wavering in the air. Alaskan thunderfuck. Nice choice. Well, looks like I found me a weed connoisseur walking the moonlit highway. (laughs) Weed connoisseur? He shrugs, then nods. Maybe, but moonlit highway? He looks out the window at the crying cloud-smothered sky and smirks. I say, use your imagination. I always do. I laugh. He doesn't. We pass a streetlight just as I glance over at him. And I notice something white and pasty above his upper lip. Hey, dude, turns toward me and I motion to my lip. You got something right there. As I'm talking, I'm also thinking, man, I hope this guy's not a tweaker. He wipes his mouth on the soaked sleeve of his jacket, which only cleans off some of the white cakey substance. The rest of it smears out toward his chin and cheek, clumping in his beard stubble. I don't mention it. Then he snorts so hard, I'm waiting for his nose to concave into his face. Oh, and make a note, he says sternly, staring at me sidelong. I'm no motherfucking hipster. He takes another toke, sucking down half the blunt with his wonder lungs. I'm a carny. A carny? Cool. I haven't met a carny before. Always something new down the road. Gotta love it. (laughs) Why? Why what? He turns toward me, wearing a sharp expression that can slice through glass. He says nothing. He hands me what's left of the blunt. A veil of smoke wafts out of his mouth and up over his face, like the curtain rising in a sideshow. 
He's the main attraction. Blunt pinch between my lips, I speed out of the breakdown lane. A rapid fire of raindrops pelts the windshield with the sound of throwing knives against unbreakable glass. The one working windshield wiper slaps the water away as fast as a one-legged man swimming laps in an Olympic-sized pool. Hell, in any size pool. Ahead of my lights, the slick wet highway glistens like diamonds as my powder blue boat sails along. Where are you headed? I ask the carny, whose head is now blowing up like a beach ball as he sucks down the last of the blunt I handed back to him. The more he inhales, the bigger his head grows, like a balloon on a helium pump valve. His top hat, which is smushing into the ceiling, now looks more like a pillbox hat on top of his enormous noggin. Man, that was a potent batch of shrooms I ate. Where are you headed? In a helium-filled voice, my question bounces off the beach ball right back at me. Uh, that's what I asked you. And I'm asking you the same. His voice is suddenly calm, inquisitive, like he's digging for something I don't know is buried. One of the smoke rings he blows out circles around his hat like a plastic ring at a ring toss game. My head is spinning in time with the slap swish of the one wiper. Where am I going? Nowhere, just driving. I don't want to tell him I'm using him for inspiration. That would take away the authenticity of the moment, the authenticity of his character. I want this song raw, uninhibited. Now, the inside of the car is one big cloud of smoke. I cough, and the smoky air undulates like the wave of an ocean. The water in is inside my boat. I feel like I'm sinking, sinking in a sea of confusion. I don't know what to make of this guy. <laughs> Just driving, you say? Carney steps out the roach in the ashtray. Are you fucking tripping or what, motherfucker? He laughs so loud, his voice echoes and reverberates off the crushing confines of my car. The doors, the dash, the roof, the back seat, all of it is moving in on us, creaking as it moves closer and closer. With every threatening inch it all moves, the vice on my chest clamps tighter and tighter. I'm losing my breath, but don't know why. Carney's energy feels heavy, with the dagger-sharp look in his eyes. He's laughing and smiling, but those eyes, they're not laughing. They're not smiling. Hey, just chill out, I tell myself. He's just down, down on his luck in a down floor. No worries, he's laughing. And you're just tripping balls. He hits the play button on the cassette player of my vintage stereo. The doors break on through, re rings out of the speakers. How does he know I'm high? High on shrooms. I'm definitely not high off that one hit of weed he so generously shared with me. My weed. The carny opens the armrest console that separates passenger from operator. He pulls out my bag of herb, what little I have left. Do you have any papers? What? You're not high enough off that whole blunt you just smoked? Uh, by yourself? What? His voice jumps an octave from its normal range. I passed it to you. Don't you remember? Or are you too high? His chortle carves crow's feet at the corners of his eye, squinty eyes. One dude, one hit, that's all. So, no, I'm not high, and no, I don't have any papers. I try not to sound pissed, but that's all the weed I have. And I need my ganja to enhance my trip, boost inspiration for the song, and, uh, oh, uh, for my bad back, you know. Aha, uh -huh. that's the problem. You're not high enough. See, if you were higher, you'd know where you're headed. You'd be able to imagine all sorts of places to go. Yeah, well, I'm imagining myself on a weed before I drop you off wherever you're headed. That's what I'm imagining right now, dude. I snatch the bag out of the moocher's mitts, stuff it back into the console, and latch the lid shut. The car swerves. Tires rumble over the wake the fuck up strip next to the breakdown lane. I jump at the sound. After riding the wheel, I rest my arm on the, on the top of the console lid, hands splayed with my fingers covering the open latch. That's all I've got to last until I get paid again. No more smoking, please. His head spins toward me the speed of a reptile, eyes bulging. He says nothing. He reaches down toward the floor into his dummy case and pulls out something shiny. A mirror, maybe? That's my best guess. The passing streetlights bounce reflections off the object he's holding hidden in the shadows. Rays of light are jumping around the car. 
when did my car turn into a disco? I could feel the carny stare boring holes into the side of my throbbing head. All I'm thinking at this point is, he better not expect to snort joke junk in my car. No fucking way that shit's going down. I like my trips paranoia free. Thank you very much. All of a sudden, he yells at top volume. I won't be disrespected, motherfucker. His voice falsettos with rage and sarcasm. Tweaker, I should know better than to challenge a potential meth head. The vice squeezes tighter around my chest. Holy tripping anxiety. I've heard about it from fellow shroomers, but I have never experienced it before. My trips are always freeing and inspirational. Next thing I know, the carny drives the, knife, the blade of a knife into the back of my hand. It pierces through flesh, scrapes past bone, and pins me to the console lid. My trip? goes bad. I scream. A strangled squeal is all that escapes me. The car swerves into the breakdown lane. The side scrapes and grinds against the guardrail. Sparks shoot up and out in all directions. The pain in my hand is overwhelming, all-consuming. What the fuck, dude? My baritone voice hits a soprano pitch it has never reached before. Not the type of feel-good song I want to write. Screamo shock rock is not my bag of jollies. I correct the steering wheel. Or think that's what I'm doing. The car bounds across the grassy median again. My body jostles around from the bouncing, jerking motion of the olds. The weight of my body yanks and pulls at my impaled hand. But the hand remains connected to the console by the blade. Blood oozes and drips. My pain multiplies and my panic follows. Headlights are speeding straight at us. I'm driving southbound in the northbound lane. Luckily, it's the middle of the night. Only one set of Lights is flying at us. I crank the wheel back toward the other side of the highway. Tire squeal. Mine or theirs? I'm not sure. Probably both. The car's ass end swerves. Mud and grass fly everywhere, splattering across the windshield. My speed decreases. I angle for the breakdown lane. Get the hell out, you crazy fucker! My words time out exactly with the screech of the tires. We come to a dead stop. I reach for the knife, but not fast enough. The psycho carny yanks the blade from my hand. Blood gushes. A choke scream shoots out of my cotton mouth. My throat feels like steel wool. Nah, that shit ain't gonna happen. He presses the cold, flat side of the knife against my throat. Drive, motherfucker. Tip of the blade pokes my skin but doesn't penetrate. I drive. The car remains in the breakdown lane. The speedometer barely hits 40. Pull back out and fucking step on it. He leans toward me. He turns the blade onto its sharp edge, but not too fast. His voice is now creepy calm. My thoughts swirl. What do you do when you pick up a hitchhiking car and you won't get out of your car? The knife, oh yeah. Can't forget about the knife through your throat and the blood gushing from your hand and the shrooms you wait 30 minutes before the pickup. I imagine hitting a passenger seat eject button and seeing the psycho fly out of the roof and down over the highway embankment. I had a rocket car. Hmm, maybe I can switch feet on the gas pedal and kick him hard enough to smash him into the window. Where are those gumby limbs when you need them? First sane thought that jumps out of my clusterfuck mind? Grab the knife! Next thoughts? With what free hand? The one with a hole in it that's spewing blood? Or the one steering? Dumbass. Then my mind screams, elbow the fucker in the face. As much as I want to, that's not an option. His arm, the one with the knife wielding hand attached, is in my swinging range. Every rational idea I'm able to sift out of my mushroom fog ends the same with my throat slit. But I take a chance. I ease my left knee up under the steering wheel and let it take over. With my one good hand, I grab the knife. Yep, I grab the damn blade of the knife. The car swerves. It helps to be able to see what you're grabbing for. I immediately pull my hand away. I grab the wheel again and regain control of the car, but not my thoughts and not the pain. I grip my teeth, biting back my groans. Blood trails around the circle in my hand and drips onto my lap. Both hands! My mind is screaming. Thank fucking God my voice is my instrument. My life! Without that, I might as well be fucking dead. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Stupid motherfucker. The carny is now speaking in a voice so calm, it seems surreal. 
I don't understand how someone can appear so calm in such a volatile situation. A sharp pinch-like sensation scatters my thinking even more. The carny has dug the tip of the blade into the flesh of my neck. The sting of the cut makes my jaw clench. I can't make a sound. More blood. The dripping tickles. I don't laugh. Yeah, that's just to let you know who's in charge here. Now, keep the car between the lines and don't test me again, or you'll get more than a little prick. His voice remains as soft as a lullaby without the calming effect. I don't know what to do. I drive. I head the highway, appears to veer to the right, but it curves to the left. The lines of the lane split and fork, then come together and cross. Yes, they are fucking crossing. I see it with my own eyes. Cold blade against my throat. I drive. I'll stop right there. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Renee. It is always such an experience to hear you read. Um, just your delivery is so much fun to listen to. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> And, and that, that story, too, takes such a turn from where it opens to where, where we've ended up by the end of that session. Yeah, watch out for those things that start out as fun. <laughs> um, but that brings us nearly to a close tonight. Um, there's lots of love coming in in the comments for all three of your stories um, from our listeners tonight. Um, people seem to be de definitely enjoying what they've heard. Um. But yeah, and thank you, um, Renee, for helping make this happen. Emma and Catherine yeah. for joining us. Um, does anyone want to say anything? Chime in with thoughts for each other for the evening. No, it was just all great readings. Yeah. I'm glad I could take part. Yeah, yeah it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you, Josh, for hosting yeah. this all. So this is great. Thank you. You. Yeah, fun. I, I, I was saying before we went live, it's so much fun to be part of a writing community here in Maine and even nationally where we can just decide that we're going to want to do a story thing. And we pulled this together in, I think, two days. We had it organized. Yes. It's like, hey, let's have a reading. And then here we are. Um, so thank you to everyone who listened. Um, I just want to shout out real quick. Um, Renee's um, book is The Bone Cutters. Catherine's is The Wild Dark, and Emma is Dark Blood Comes from the Feet. Um, definitely check out, um, we're all on social media, we all have websites, um, we all have books out, so um, read what we, we've got if you like what you heard, um, support other local authors, um, and also um, indie bookstores, definitely check out um, all of our mm. books around the state. Um, and yeah, everyone enjoy your evening. Enjoy your Halloween. May it be spooky and very, very fun. Happy Halloween, <laughs> everyone. Yes, happy Halloween.